here with Monty Hyten and Lisa Jackson, two longtime members of NSH who are currently serving on NSH's Public Relations Committee. One of the things that the PR committee does is plan the celebration of Histology Professionals Day, or HPD. HPD is celebrated on March 10th as a day dedicated to recognizing the role of Histotex in the laboratory and the important work that they do every day saving lives, one slide at a time. 2020 marks a decade since the first HPD was celebrated. To honor this occasion, we're asking Histotex to submit an audio or video clip, photos or article, documenting lab life in 2020 and what has changed over the last decade and their careers as a whole. These submissions will be included in a virtual time capsule to be open for HPD in 2030. Today, Monty and Lisa are going to talk about the momentous changes in the field that they were a part of during their histology careers. So what are some daily tasks that you started out doing in the early years that went away or completely changed as practices changed? One of the things that mm. went away is every morning you had to get your knives and test them and what we did for testing our knives, you just ran your thumb across the blade to make sure there was no nick in the blade. If you had a nick in your blade, then you had to go and sharpen your blade. The surgeon left a staple in a piece of gut or wherever it may have been, and it got embedded that way, then you put a really big divot in your knife edge, which then had to be ground out. So we had we did have an automatic grinder that you had to take the edge totally off your blade and then start over again, which took hours sometimes. So that was very, very labor intensive, sitting there sharpening your blade. The other thing that we had to do, we had to make all our own solutions. We had to make the hematoxylin. We had to make all our special stain solutions because there was nothing that was pre-made. So you had the hematoxylin powder, you had the powdered eosin, and then you had to wash your dishes once a week. So that was very labor intensive. You had to dump your stains and physically wash everything. You had to wash your buckets on the tissue processor, and you had to make all your alcohols. We had to make our own formalin. So there were a lot of things that we had to do in preparation to start your day. Our lab was the same way. Uh, we usually had anywhere from five to 600 slides a day, and our staining basket held between 50 and 100 slides, some 25. You know, everything was handmade, shifts reagent. Sometimes you'd have pink all over the place and you didn't know it till later when, you know, you touch something and your hand turned pink. Can you describe some of the equipment that you guys used? Our tissue processors. We had the old-fashioned tissue processors that were open, so the rooms were full of xylene and formalin and all of these things. We had large baths of water that formalin buckets sat in. So when the pathologist grossed the tissue, they put the tissue in metal cassettes, and the metal cassettes were thrown in this water bath that had the heated formalin in them. So the, the fixation was great back then because you had tissue that was fixing in hot formalin from the very beginning. And you couldn't cut very, very large pieces of tissue because the cassettes would not hold that much tissue. When I started in the early 70s, we embedded with lead L's. The tissue was placed on a two-inch square metal plate, and we had lead L-shaped metal things. And we called them lead L's because that's what they were. And we placed them around the tissue, and we poured melted paraffin from a pitcher in them to form the blocks. After the blocks cooled, which back in the day it took, probably 15, 20 minutes, maybe longer, for the blocks to solidify. Then we popped the blocks out of the lead L's, and we mounted them with heat on a wooden chuck. So everything was cut on a wooden chuck. Then at the end of the day, we took the blocks off of the wooden chuck, and we sealed them. We had to seal all our blocks with a heated spatula, and then we stored them. To identify the tissue, we had paper numbers. So we had to take a pencil, a lead pencil, and write the surgical number, the year, and we also put little pieces of paper in each block that said levels, special stains, cut extras. So it was very labor intensive. 
but we did not have as many blocks as they do now because everything was just large. And then at the end of every day, we had to wash and clean the cassettes. There were no disposable cassettes. Now, this is Monty, and I guess when I took my training, I was at Indiana University Medical Center, and we were very similar to what Lisa has described. The only automation that we had at that time were autotechnicons, which, as Lisa has described, were just open. They breathed, looked like they were breathing up and down. That was the agitation back then. There was really no heat except in the paraffin pots, but the baskets were removed each morning. We placed ours on a large hot plate. It was long enough that two of us could embed at a time, and we had just metal like teapots that were filled with formalin, and then the spouts were kept warm by Bunsen burner. And that's also how we kept our forceps warm to embed with was, you know, heating them in the in the Bunsen burner flame. So depending on how adept you were at embedding, I'm sure there were times where we probably scalded the the tissues a little bit. We had the L's for things that were very large, but we also had what we called ice cube trays that were just little squares. Now they're Slats could be taken out if you needed to make them bigger, but we used the L's for that. Embedded in uniformly square little molds that were all attached. And then once those solidified a little bit, then we plunged our whole embedding ice cube tray into cold water in a sink. We had to hand label every slide. There was no automated slide labeler at that time. But cover slipping was by hand. That was also very labor intensive. And we had to have five to 600 slides out between 11 and noon every day for our pathologist. And we still covered frozen sections at that time. We happened to have three hospitals that we covered for frozen section along with all of the labor intensive other jobs that we had all morning long. All of the hospitals that I worked at, frozen sections were... Either the cryostat was in the OR, a room set aside next to the OR. So when there was a frozen, they called down and said, we have a frozen. And the pathologist and the tech had to run upstairs to do the frozen. Or as space got more narrow, they brought the cryostat downstairs so they would have a volunteer bring the tissue to us. And we were timed. So we had to clock in when they called us and said a frozen's on the way. We had to make sure we got the pathologist in our room. When they gave us the tissue, then we had to freeze it, cut it, stain it, cover slip it, and give it back to the pathologist within 12 minutes because we had a 15-minute window to get the report or the diagnosis back to the surgeon. Our situation was very similar to that, but we did not have anything brought back to the hospital lab. I think just because we were in a medical center type setting and we did have three hospitals that we serviced, there was space in every hospital for pathology to do the frozen sections. So there was a cryostat there. The issue came is if you had a cryostat that went down, then you had to make arrangements to run back to the laboratory or one of the other hospital setups. So we were not fortunate enough to have backup equipment in any of the surgery areas. So that was always an awful situation is if you had a cryostat go down and you didn't know it till you got to the surgery area. And we also had a problem with every now and then housekeeping or somebody would walk through the lab or walk through the frozen section room and turn the cryostat off. And we didn't know it until we actually got called for a frozen and we'd walk in there and you had a hot cryostat. So then you gathered up four or five cans of OCT and sprayed and sprayed and sprayed to get it cold enough that you could cut a frozen section because you had a patient laying on the table and all they wanted was a diagnosis. We did a lot of scrambling back then. I think one of the bigger changes, there were no fume hoods anywhere in the lab. So we were exposed to all those toxic fumes on a daily basis. Fumes, the fumes from cover slipping, that was bad. Yeah, it sounds like there was not a lot of safety regulations back then. So what would you guys say, like when did that start to change? Probably in the late 
80s to 90s for me. Back in the 70s and the early 80s, we still ate, drank, and smoked in the lab. And I had to get, I can cover slips faster if I'm smoking. So you had <laughs> dialing flammable, you had your cover slip, your mounting media, an ashtray, and you were cover slipping. And you could cover slip real fast if you were smoking. Oftentimes, we didn't have breaks. You just worked until lunchtime. You went to lunch. You came back and you continued to work. We always had a donut, a sandwich, or candy sitting right there. And you were eating in the lab. You were drinking in the lab. We always had a soda right next to the microtone. Yeah, our situation was very similar, except the histology lab was always in charge of any food or party coffee pot for the whole department, pathologists and all, was in the histology lab with all those chemicals around. And, yes, people did have their donut or, you know, snack. We did leave for lunch typically, but, you know, we had to take shifts of break for lunch to cover for frozen sections. But that was very typical to eat and smoke. I never smoked, but many of the people in the lab did smoke. There would be a cigarette in their mouth and ash falling into the xylene container where the slides were. But we cover slept pretty fast back in those days. Yes, we did. And we also, at the end of every day, you had to file your blocks, file your slides. We had to store the slides two weeks or more to let them completely dry before you could file them. And usually the filing for histology, other than the current one month's worth, everything was in the basement and it was usually dark and damp in the basement. One of the hospitals I worked at, we had rats. So whenever you would go down there, you'd have to ring a bell, make a noise, stomp your feet, and turn the lights on, flick them back and forth so the rats and the mice would go away so you could safely get in and out before something happened. Oftentimes when you went to retrieve old blocks, half of them were ate up because the mice and the rats like to eat them. Yes, the tissue would be gone. That was another thing that we had to face at the medical center because they hadn't disposed of any blocks ever. And you began to have a storage issue, even though we did have a large storage area in the basement, like Lisa mentioned. So we had to ask the powers that be, uh, which went to lawyers, I'm sure, as to how we could dispose of paraffin blocks that were, you know, 50 years old or more. Obviously, the cases had been signed out and were over. So it was determined there was no way to just, we couldn't just throw the blocks away. So we couldn't incinerate. We had a, there was an incinerator uh, at the med center that was operated by you know the maintenance group. So it was determined that we had to melt all the blocks down, remove the paraffin from the tissue, so that the tissue then could be handed off to the incinerator area for burning. So that was a huge issue uh, that took place. We had medical students that took up one end of our building where they had their cadavers and we created all their study set slides. So they would not be there during summer hours. And so we took everything down there, all the blocks that were denoted as disposable, and they just set up big Bunsen burner stands and heated big pots of blocks until they melted. And then we'd pour off the hot paraffin, reserve the tissue back, and that was a huge mess until many years later when things were changed. My experience was exactly the same. We threw everything in a great big pot, melted it down, and took the tissue, and then we were able to throw the tissue in the incinerator. So we just had these big batches of just gunky, melted tissue. It was quite messy and very, very smelly. Wow. <laughs> um, so, like, when did the, when did they start having regulations about that stuff? When did they start having stuff like cap inspections and setting those kind of standards that would change so even, like, how long you had to keep the blocks? My first cap inspection was in the 90s. In the 80s, 83, 84, 85, I was inspected by the state. I was at a medical center. We were inspected by the state. 
and the regulations were not as stringent in histology, pathology, cytology, as they were in the rest of the lab. We didn't have to keep temperature charts. When the inspectors came, they just kind of did a gloss over. They were more concerned with the pathologist and the slime rather than the chemicals and all of the stuff that was in histology. They never said anything about its eating. Ashtrays were sitting next to the microtome. They never said anything about that. They didn't get very stringent on us until in the 90s, and that's when we started getting our first CAP inspections, and that's when they sent all the regulations about temperature charts, how often are you washing your dishes, are you filtering your hematoxylin, because back then we made our hematoxin and you had to filter it every single morning. I think we started having inspections maybe a little sooner than Lisa, but as she mentioned, we had state inspections by the Board of Health, but we also started having, and I don't know if they were actually deemed CAP inspections then, but I think it may have been the early onset of that because the pathologists more or less monitored each other. So as it is today, a group of pathologists would come into the laboratory, but they would make suggestions, but there wasn't a lot of criteria then. It was just kind of an oversight to see how things were being operated, but they didn't want to be too critical of each other at that time. So there might have been some suggestions made, but it wasn't as stringent at that time. I agree, because back then, the pathologists, they were interrelated back then. You know, they kept up with each other. They talked to each other. A lot of them covered for each other when they were on vacations or they had other family issues. It wasn't like it is now. And there were not pathology groups. They, there were groups of friends. Like each pathologist knew the other pathologist, and they exchanged knowledge as far as if they had trouble with the case, they would send slides from one hospital to the other hospital, getting their various opinions. They don't do that now. Speaking of that exchange of knowledge, so before the Internet and the age of instant information where we have the block and we have the Facebook page that people today are using to exchange information, um, what was the big way that you guys really did that kind of collaboration? At NSH. State the meeting. NSH. I've been a member of the mm -hmm. NSH. My first NSH was in 1977 in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I never knew there was a such thing as the NSH, but my supervisor at the time was one of the founding members. So she was the one that said, you got to go to this. I was totally shocked and amazed because the only two books I ever had in my hand was a Desna Sheehan and an Ann Priest. When I went into this girl's lab and found out they're histology books, they're people that do this. And when I went to my first national, I was amazed that there were people there whose fingers looked like mine because you could always <laughs> tell a histotech because their thumbs were black from the lead, <laughs> the pencils writing on the cassettes. And always on the weekends, every Friday, you had a GMS stain so your hands were black or <laughs> your nose was red from the eosin. So I was totally amazed when I saw people that looked like me. It's like, oh, my God, you must be a histotech. And back in the olden days, every laboratory, we exchanged knowledge. If you had a machine and you didn't know how to work it or the manual was lost, you could call another hospital and say, may I have the histology department? Do you have a processor like this? Oh, no, I don't have one, but I know somebody that's got one. And you could call somebody and say, can you send me a copy of your manual? And people didn't mind sharing their knowledge. So I had manuals from every hospital in the St. Louis area. Um, if you ran out of hematoxylin or you ran out of eosin, you could call up a laboratory and say, hey, I don't have any eosin. Do you have any? Oh, yeah, I got some. I'll send it over to you. So we exchanged things. I had a yeah, water bath that down. And I called somebody I knew and they said, oh, we got four water baths. Send somebody over here and we'll let you have our water bath and you keep it until you get yours. So there was more collaboration between techs and labs back then. Yeah, at NSH is where we did our networking, where you found out what other people were doing. They were doing things similar to you. You exchanged names. You took down each other's phone numbers so that you had colleagues that you could contact. 
we may not have reached out to other hospitals in our area. We we did if things were an emergency, but you always had colleagues that you met through NSH and our state meetings so that you had people you could call if you had trouble with decalcification or IHC was in its infancy then and we didn't have the types of uh, reagents and, you know, you bought your antibodies raw always, your buffers you made up yourself, everything that you used back in that time was created by your own hands. So we did do a lot of telephone calls and that sort of thing at that time because there was no email, no internet, nothing that you could look up. Like Lisa mentioned, um, I passed my registry and my practical at that time, which was back in the early 70s, with just a Desna Sheehan and a Nan Priest <laughs> reference books. So it wasn't until later that we had a lot more knowledge provided to us through reference books. Greatest thrill of my life is when I met Desna Sheehan because I thought she was just like a rock star. Then I went to the AFIP and I met Lee Luna and I thought, oh my God, look at his lab. I, I was just totally amazed because these are books that you read and you actually got to touch and talk to the people that wrote those things. <laughs> in the process, it was like I, I just couldn't believe I was, I was meeting these people. So you've mentioned IHC, and that's a popular thing now. When did that kind of start in your lab? Our pathologist had went to some workshop. This was probably 81, 82, 83, and we did a little IHC by hand, and it was very, very time-consuming. They didn't have kits. So we were doing everything by hand. We were incubating, and it took hours and hours. The pathologist really liked it, but there were no kits, so it was very expensive to do. So for probably two, three months, the pathologists were all gung-ho on doing PSAs, and then after a while they thought, ah, oh, nah, that's just too time-consuming. Let's not do it because we were in a smaller hospital. I think our lab, I started early in the mid-70s doing a lot of immunofluorescence. A lot of my work was kidney-based. We had a pathologist who concentrated on nephrology. So I did a lot of immunofluorescence like IgG, IgA, IgF on kidney biopsies. That was, as Lisa mentioned, it was very labor-intensive. And there were some things that you started at the end of the day so that they could incubate overnight and then finish up the following morning, but nothing was created for us. We had to, as we mentioned earlier, everything was done by hand and created by mixing ourselves or diluting. So it was a lot of trial and error. We had to make a lot of notes to be able to successfully reproduce those results every time. But I did start probably in 1975, and we had to look at them quickly, so I had to make sure I did it on a day when my pathologist was available to look at the slides that day or the next day. That's right, because they faded. Yes. And what was, we would say, the biggest technology change in the course of your career? It's been almost a 100-degree change. The, there's been a change in the embedding. We have embedding centers now. No longer do you have an open flame in the lab because we had the hot plate and the Bunsen burner. So embedding has been a big change. The enclosed tissue processor, that's a big change. Pre-made hematoxylin and special stain solutions. Also special stain automation. You have a special stainer. Everything has changed. Motorized microtomes. <laughs> exactly. Every, nothing was automated, even our autotechnicons back when I first started were very simple pieces of equipment. There wasn't much to them other than they raised up, rotated one station and went down and agitated up and down. So automation has made a huge change. Our vendors are much more available than they were at the time. We were fortunate that there was someone out of Cincinnati, which was about an hour and a half drive to Indianapolis, that came on a moment's notice if we had equipment that went down. But things are much 
more dependable now, I believe. The equipment that is available now doesn't stop working as easily as some of the early equipment did. Automation has made a huge change in histology. And I think that probably besides IHCs, molecular is probably the newest, most, most needed and being developed most rapidly now. That was going to be my next question. I was about to ask you what you think the next big change will be for the field of histotechnology. Yeah, I think it's molecular. I think IHC will continue to to be a huge part of diagnosis, but molecular will also become very much needed. And, you know, that's where I believe laboratories are going to begin to focus. And it's also very in-depth testing. So there again, I think with NSH leadership moving to try to educate our legislators on how important and highly trained that we are to perform a lot of this testing that's done in our labs now. I agree. I agree. It will be driven by the NSH and with input from the pathologists because the pathologists will drive this movement toward getting histology recognized as professionals. And then just to kind of wrap things up, do you guys have a favorite story of something that happened in the lab during your career? I have tons and tons of funny stories. (laughs) But my funniest story was we used to make our hematoxylin a gallon at a time. So when you made your hematoxylin, you made it in this big one-gallon bottle, and you sat it in the sink to cool. So we made the hematoxylin, sat it in the sink, It was cool, and picked up the gallon jug and turned and hit the corner of the counter. The jar broke. There was hematoxin all over the floor, all over me, and I'm standing there, and I'm just a great big blue mess, and the pathologist (laughs) walked in. And he just looked at me, and he said, when we do foolish things, we look foolish when we clean it up. And he walked out, and I just stood there and cried. I looked like an earth. Well, this is Monty, and I think probably it wasn't funny, but I couldn't help but laugh. Our laboratory supervisor and the assistant supervisor were taking charge of melting all of these blocks when we were told that we could dispose of X number of years. And... We were carrying carts and blocks back, you know, down to the area where they were, had all these Bunsen burners set up with these big dishes full of bubbling paraffin. And one of them, when they were pouring off the paraffin, somehow they dropped. I don't know if it was so hot and they didn't have the right type of glove on to protect themselves, but they dropped the whole vat. And obviously, it was slippery. And my supervisor fell. And when the assistant supervisor went over to help her up, she fell. And they were just wallowing in this paraffin mess. And I came charging in with my cart full of more blocks. And I, it was just kind of like an Abbott and Costello comedy because they would start to get up and they'd fall down and start to get up and they'd fall down. And they were totally coated in paraffin by the time we were able to get them out of the slippery mess. So neither one of them went home. They worked the whole day. And, and of course, then we did not wear scrubs or pants-type clothing. We were in uniform dresses. So it was quite a sight. Yikes. Okay. Well, thank you guys for being here with us today and sharing this information with us. Thanks, Natalie.